Hey everyone, welcome here. My name is Pastor Adam. Thanks for joining another one of our streams and another one of our videos. Today we are continuing on in our series on the book of Philippians. And we are seeing what God wants to say to us and what he wants to speak to us through this book. This book is amazing, it's powerful, it's life-changing, and there's something for you here today. So let's take a moment and let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for the opportunity to study the book of Philippians, to run together as a a group of believers, and to see the truth you want to show to us. So Lord, I thank you to speak through me clearly to this amazing audience as we study this book of the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, a quick thing, if you're joining us on YouTube, you're going to want to make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button. And also, if you're joining us on Facebook in a stream or the premiere, you're going to want to uh, like and follow us on Facebook as well. Join the community. We got lots of amazing online content coming out every single week to help you grow in Christ and learn more about Jesus. Now, if you haven't checked out uh, my previous video on uh, the Philippians part one, uh, you're going to want to check that out. And so I'm going to put, if you're on YouTube, there'll be a card right here that you can click and you can... uh, Go to that video, check that out before you watch this one. If you're on Facebook, you can even uh, just uh, click, even I would say click off this video, go to the first one, and then come back and watch this one. It's in our video sections there. You'll be able to see it. It'll be a similar thumbnail, and uh, you'll be able to kind of get the overview of the book of Philippians in the introduction in the first part of this chapter. And so just to kind of give another little snippet of the overview of this book, it's a really interesting book because it's uh, this book is written to the first group of people that Paul, the Apostle Paul, ever ministered to in in, uh, the area of Macedonia. And so he comes and the first place he goes is Philippi and he ministers to the people there. And this uh, place in Macedonia, this uh, uh, Philippi, was this very par- patriotic city full of like people who were uh, Roman citizens and they were uh, very um, sold out to Rome and sold out to Caesar. And so this is kind of the context in which he writes this letter. And What's amazing about this letter is it's actually a one big thank you letter to the church in Philippi because they have sent a gift to Paul, uh, or they sent Epaphroditus to bring a gift to Paul of money to help him and support him while he was in prison. And so he sends this letter back with Epaphroditus thanking them. Uh, thanking the church in Philippi for sending this letter and in the or sending the gift and in the midst of this letter, what we find is a very powerful truth that our life as believers is meant to reflect Jesus. And so, what's interesting also about this book is it has uh, no real. A climax. A lot of Paul's books have this central climax it's building to, but this one doesn't. It's really casual, almost as if it's written to friends. And it's a thank you letter, but it's this kind of uh, com- composition of a series of essays centered around a poem in chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. A classic poem, and we'll get there eventually, and then you'll be able to read that. And so, oh, or sorry, chapter 2, verse 6 to 11 is the poem. Uh, uh, t- 1, verse 12 to 26 is what we're going through today. And so, Uh, What we're going to do in this series is we're going to focus on these essays and we're going to unpack them a little bit and we're going to see how our lives can be transformed and changed so that as we live out an everyday normal life, normal as in the Christian life, uh, we look like Jesus in all that we do, in all our conduct and all that we do. And so... um, What we're going to be going through today is chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. And so we're we're going to find, again, that our story, kind of this, and this is the main idea, is that our story as believers, our life story lived out, is always meant to reflect Jesus. In everything we do, in all that we do, in this, um, what most people would look at as normal things even, our life is meant to reflect Jesus. And Paul, actually, in the kind of a center verse uh, for this uh, section of scripture we're going to, verse 21, he coins this really well. He coins this idea really well. He says this, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And Paul, as an apostle, as a Christian, and as a person um, who wasn't always a Christian, wasn't a devout follower of Jesus until he had this encounter. He was actually against the church for so many years. And uh, he was trying to stop the spread of the gospel. And yet when he had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life, he concluded that his life lived out. His whole world, um, his true purpose, everything, his whole effort of living is more fulfilling, more rich, and more life-giving when it goes fully surrendered into living to reflect Jesus and serve him in this world. And so this is what Paul concluded, and I believe it's what we can conclude as well. So let's go to verse 12 here. Uh, let's, re- let's read verse 12 to 14. It says this, 
Uh, so Paul, he's uh, talking to the Philippians and here's what he says. He says in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The gospel being the good news of Jesus. He says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my, uh, or all, all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So here's a big deal. So Paul, he is currently, uh, as I said, he's in prison. He's in prison for sharing Jesus. And yet what's amazing is that he chooses uh, that in the midst of his imprisonment, he st- chooses to still live out Christ in that to the point where everybody in the prison knows that the reason he's in prison is on, for the sake of Jesus Christ. He said, for the sake of the gospel. How amazing is that? So rather than getting discouraged in the midst of life, what se- seemed like a failure, what seemed like an attack, what seemed like destruction, Paul never backs off of his true purpose to reflect Jesus in all that he does. And in the midst of what could be a trial and could be destruction, he's still reflecting Jesus. He's still uh, sharing the gospel. And it ends up being a victory because everybody in there, all these people that maybe he wouldn't have been able to share Jesus with before, are able to hear the gospel are able to hear the message of Jesus. You know, I think of uh, in this story, a scenario, sort of like of my grandma uh, when she was back still alive. And uh, she had some health problems and things like that. And so when these health problems would come at her and come against her, it was almost like the enemy was trying to uh, take her out. So many times uh, the devil tried to take her out and yet she would still live. We'd say like, my goodness, she, she's going to outlive us all. You know, that was the kind of idea. And she would be going to the hospital and in the midst of the hospital, uh, not, not her saying God did this to me, anything like that, but she would choose to be a light and share Jesus with as many people as she could. So she would see people and the people beside her get saved. She would see the people in the elevator get saved. Other people get healed. Some people, she'd meet Christians that weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she'd pray for them. And they'd get baptized in the Holy Spirit in the hospital. And the most amazing testimonies would come out of her being in that place. The enemy was trying to take her out. And yet she would stand and be a light no matter where she was at reflecting Jesus in all that she did so that the people in the hospital knew, my goodness, this lady loves Jesus and is serving Jesus and is different. And that's the idea. It's everything we do, no matter what life is bringing our way, we can reflect Jesus. And it says in verse 14, and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak without fear. See, what's amazing is that when in life, when we choose to in all that we do, whether it's good, bad, uh, normal, uh, not normal, whatever life circumstances is, whatever it is, when we choose to maintain a reflection of Jesus, to share Jesus, to act like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, keep seeking the Lord, keep that relationship on fire for Jesus. Uh, when we do that and we're that person who walks through the fire and chooses to say, I'm surrendering to Jesus. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we come out not burned. Other people will look at your life, at your world, and it will give them boldness. It will give them the ability to stand in a way that they wouldn't have been able to stand before. Uh, You know, actually in your brain, there is this thing called um, uh, mirror uh, neurons. They're, They're this kind of mechanism that when you see something or you see a person doing something, your brain will act like, will register the story like you're the one doing it, like you're the main character. This is why we love like love stories, hero stories, all these things, because that mirror neuron is firing and it's treating it like we're the one in the center of the story. So this is what's amazing about testimonies, uh, sharing the gospel, sharing stories, and seeing other people live out this life of faith, which is, you know, this is basic discipleship, is that for us watching, who maybe haven't walked through those things before, all of a sudden our brains trigger to empower us to mirror that lifestyle. Uh, This is why uh, Paul said to his churches, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul would keep his eyes focused on Jesus and would imitate uh, Jesus. And he would tell the churches, watch how I live and imitate me. And they would do this. And so when we're willing to walk out the gospel and reflect Jesus, we are actually subsequently 
empowering other people to do the same, having a voice in other people's lives to change their world and to uh, speak into the world in a way that we maybe wouldn't have been able to do before. So Paul in prison is still choosing to reflect and share Jesus no matter what. And he goes on to say this in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. These are people who, um, uh, see that Paul's in prison. He's sharing the gospel. They're getting bold, but the reason they're bold, getting boldness is not necessarily good, but because they, again, envy and rivalry is in their heart. They want to, they want to become the guy. They want to become the high up person. They want to become the person with status. And so that's why they're preaching the gospel. Uh, and so, um, here's what he says in verse 16, but the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former Proclaim Christ at a rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So they want his position as apostle. They want his position as leader. And they're thinking, we, hey, we can come after this stuff by preaching Christ and preaching the gospel and uh, maybe rob Paul of some position and things like that. And here's what he says. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed in that I rejoice. In that I rejoice. And so... What's amazing here is Paul is saying, you know, the main thing is that Jesus is preached. So if somebody's preaching with a wrong motive, Paul is saying, you know, I don't actually care. As long as they're preaching Jesus, as long as they're sharing Jesus with other people, if it's at a rivalry, but they're sharing Jesus, somebody's getting the gospel and that's exciting. And so he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of his, losing his position. He wasn't intimidated of these people trying to take it. He didn't view his position as an apostle, as something to be like clamped onto. I got to maintain this. I got to maintain this. No, he had it surrendered to the Lord. And this is actually such a reflection of the poem, the center poem that uh, we see in uh, chapter two, where it says that Jesus Christ did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but was willing to be nothing. See, the most powerful person in God's kingdom is the person who's most willing to be nothing. The person who's most willing to surrender status and uh, the opinion of others just simply to reflect Jesus in all that they do. If you want to be a powerful Christian in this life, if you want to influence other people, change your workplace, all this stuff, then become the greatest servant of all. Become the greatest one. Become the one like Paul who's willing to go to prison. And even in the midst of prison, rather than being discouraged or dismayed, was still saying, over there on the other side of my jail is a person who needs Jesus. Over that other jail cell, that person needs Jesus, and I'm going to reflect him. And these these prisons weren't nice either. They were gross. They were awful. Roman prisons were terrible, and yet he's still reflecting Jesus. And in the same way, we need to choose to, in everything that we do, reflect Jesus. Don't, if you want to be powerful, serve people, reflect Jesus in everywhere, everywhere you go. If maybe you're in a work, a, a job that you're like, man, I don't know about this job. You know how you can conquer it? You know how you can make it amazing? Reflect Jesus. Share the gospel. Uh, now, another big thing I'm saying, reflect Jesus. A lot of people uh, will say lines like this. Um, Share the gospel at all times. And if you have to, use words. Some kind of line like that. That's dumb. Like, can I, I'll be real with that. Yeah, we, we're supposed to reflect Jesus in our life lived out. But part of reflecting Jesus is the sharing of the gospel, is the speaking of the gospel, is sharing the good news of Jesus, telling people about Jesus. You know, one of the things about Paul is that everybody knew that he was in prison for Christ. How would they know unless he talked about it? They wouldn't. They wouldn't know unless he talked about it. He had to have talked about it. So choose to let Christ be verbal in your life. Uh, you know, God said, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll, or Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you reject me before men or don't acknowledge me, I won't acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. You need to be willing to share that you follow Jesus in your everyday life, everywhere you go. And so let's go on to verse 19 here. Verse 19. Paul continues and he says, Yes, I will rejoice. I will rejoice that Christ is preach. For I know that through your prayers, through your prayers, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So you got to see, Paul believes in the, uh, that the changing power of prayer. You notice how I find it really interesting is that he um, doesn't say that if God wills it, I'll be released from prison. Notice that's interesting because that's what we would think. If it be God's will, I'll be released from prison. But you know what he says? No, he says, 
through your prayers and through the work of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that empowers your prayers, by the way. And it's the Spirit that empowers you to live different. The Holy Spirit. He says, if this will turn out for my deliverance from prison. He has this assurance that prayer changes things. And he's taken that. So in our prayers, we reflect Jesus. We reflect the Jesus who prayed and things happened. Things changed. Don't give up on your prayers and don't back off. Your prayers are changing things. And he says, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And so he's saying, you know what? In all things, in every way, as I live out this life, Christ is going to be honored. In my physical life lived out, Christ is going to be honored. I am going to look like Jesus. And here's where he says the, the key phrase, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. So he's saying, my life lived out the way I'm going to live. Everything, every part of my life is to reflect Jesus. For me to live as Christ. He's let go of every other motive for living. You got to get that for a second. Every other motive for living, every other reason for being, he's let go of other than to reflect Jesus in this world. What are the motives that are in your heart for living? What are the things you're living for that maybe you're holding on to tightly? Has Jesus affected those things? Has Jesus taken the throne of your heart and is really sitting on it? Because Paul says in every way, how I actually live out, I'm going to reflect Jesus. Again, one of the big keys and uh, themes in these streams that I do is that if everybody, if people were to look at your life, would they see Jesus? Would they know? Would they say, man, that person, Jesus is on the throne of their heart. I know it. I can see it. Would they know? Because Paul is saying in everything I do, whether I'm in prison or out of prison, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. And so here's what he's saying. Let's keep going here. Verse 20, verse 22. He says, for if I am in, uh, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So what's he meaning? He said, hey, if I'm going to live out my life, man, I'm going to shake the world. I'm going to reflect Jesus and all that to do. People are going to come to Christ. Churches are going to be planted. Lives are going to be changed. You know, I'm, it's going to be awesome. Demons are going to be cast out. The sick are going to be healed. It's going to be amazing. For me, it's, it's, I'm going to show people that uh, Jesus is Lord. That's fruitful labor for me. Yet, um, yet what, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. This is such an interesting thought process that he has here. He's saying that his heart is so in love with Jesus that he'd be totally willing to walk away from this whole world just to be with Jesus. The question is, have we fallen in love with Jesus that much? Does, is that our story? Is your story, man, I've fallen in love with Jesus and I look at the rest of this world. And this is a theme throughout the book that you'll see. I've looked at the rest of this world, everything I could have had, and it's all filthy rags. It's all nothing compared to him. It's all nothing compared to the experience I've had in Jesus. You know, I hear, I hear so many people that they say like stuff like, man, no, I want to do X, Y, and Z before I meet Jesus, before I, I go to be with him, all that stuff. And um, before he comes back, whatever. Man, when I hear that, I'm like, Y'all need to just really experience the love and relationship that Jesus offers because there is nothing more amazing than Jesus. He is the best thing in the world. He is the best thing in the world. He's everything you've been looking for your whole life. Amazing joy and peace in life. And Paul got that. When he experienced, he was going to the road of Damascus and uh, he's going there to put Christians in prison and he gets this vision and this light appears and he's blinded by the light it's so intense and uh, Jesus is standing before him and basically says Saul uh, you know uh, Paul why are you persecuting me why are you coming against me and he has this experience with the with Jesus Christ and it changes his whole world and in that moment he realizes he's everything I've been looking for my whole life he's the only reason worth living it, on this earth he's the only reason worth living for and I'm going to reflect him in everything I do and so he acts again like Christ who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but was willing to give it up. Are we willing to look at our life, at our world, and say, Jesus, I'll lay a doll down at your feet just so I can have you, just so I can have a real relationship, a deep relationship with you. I'll give it all up just to know your name. And so he says this, convinced of this, that it's better that I stay 
to be here on your account so that I can see fruitful growth in your life. He understands that, hey, these people, they need me because I'm walking this out. And if I leave, they may walk away from Christ. And so I need to stay. And there's more people that need to hear the gospel through me. So I'm going to stay. And so he says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the, your progress and joy in the faith so that with, uh, in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. And so he's saying that basically that whole thing is like, he'd be totally cool if he stayed in prison and he ended up dying for the gospel. He'd be totally good with that. He'd say, yeah, I'll go be with Jesus. I'll die for his name. But he says, but I know this, that there are people in this world that need me. They need me on the earth because I'm reflecting Christ. You guys, I know you guys need me. And I want to bring joy to you by being able to come to you again rather than departing. So because I know this, because I know you need me and there's purpose for me, my life on the earth to reflect Christ, I know this will turn out for my deliverance. I know I'll be released from prison. This is what he's saying. There are other letters uh, later in the New Testament where Paul says, you know what? I've run my race. I've kept the faith. I know where I'm going. I'm going to be with the Lord. And it's time to pass off the torch. But that's not this case. And so in our own lives, in our own world, as we live, the question is in our story, is our story in a place where we've met the cross and we've laid down our own life? Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must give up his life to follow me. Because what would it profit a whole man to gain the world and yet forfeit him to his very self? And so for us today, our own world, you know, in your life, are you reflecting Jesus in all that you do? And the only way to do that is to give it up, to lay it all down at the feet of Jesus, to give up every idol of the heart and say, Jesus, you're all I want. You're all I need. And in this world, I want to reflect you so that the whole world can know that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is King. So thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back here next week, Thursday, 7 p.m. And I just want to take a moment and I want to pray for you because God wants that life for you. He wants you to be an accurate, amazing reflection of Jesus and all that you do. So Jesus, I just pray for everyone who's watched the stream, for everyone who's on uh, YouTube, Facebook, wherever they're at. Lord Jesus, I pray that their lives would become an amazing, accurate reflection of Christ in all that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you, and we will see you on the stream or possibly in church either uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. or Tuesday evening, 6.30 p.m. See you then.